Hello, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Wolf Wraith, and thank you for joining me today for a new episode of In The Mist, the series where I talk about a game I'm in the midst of playing and the impression it gives. Today, I'm showcasing a game called Downward. It's been in early access as of the 19th of December 2016, and got an official release on the 14th of July 2017, so it wasn't released all that long ago. It was developed and published by a company called Caracal Games. Downward is a first-person open-world parkour platforming adventure game set in the ruins of a post-apocalyptic Earth. The story involves you playing as an unnamed character who has to figure out the mystery behind the apocalypse. The Earth has been left in ruins and most of civilization has been wiped out. You're pretty much one of the last known survivors on the planet. You awaken in some mysterious astral plane with a lot of floating rock formations above an ocean and a mysterious voice then leads you on a journey to solve this big mystery. The story is delivered in a few ways. You have real-time dialogue that occurs during gameplay. Was, was that someone talking? It's possible there's still someone alive down here. There's ancient items that you can find, and each of these explain a bit about the previous civilization. It's cold here, isn't it? <laughs> then there's cutscenes that are also delivered in real time. Ugh, my head. That was a bad fall. Now, where did I end up? The voice acting for the main character is a bit hit and miss. At the start, he can sound a bit weak and flat when it comes to expressing certain emotions, but the way the character is portrayed actually comes off as somewhat relatable, their reactions being akin to what some people might have in the same situation. A few hours into the game, however, and it starts to improve. The character's personality is somewhat limited by the voice acting, but they come off as very keen and at times silly. Haha, <laughs> it's adorable. Other characters I've encountered are pretty interesting. There's an old man who's also the merchant. He provides some amusement and humor to the game, while also providing some wisdom to the main character. The giant tortoise that I encountered seems to have an odd attraction to humans. The voice that guides you doesn't show themselves from the start, but their character helps add to the mystery. Overall, voice acting for these characters so far is also hit and miss. The old man sounds okay, while other characters fall a bit short in convincing you. And you know how to talk to a lady. Huh, a lady, yes. I'm liking what the story is doing so far, it's a bit cliche, but mysterious enough to keep you intrigued. I like the way it's delivered because it feels very organic and natural, which helps to keep you immersed. Mystery is done fairly well, although more background information on the main character would have been nice. It's got a good amount of dialogue as well, and more importantly, for an indie game, it's delivered with voice acting. Despite being a bit hit and miss at times, it's actually a very welcome touch. The game offers and advertises quite a few features. There's parkour, where you can use the techniques of wall jumps, wall runs, climbing, sprints, and more to traverse the altered landscapes. There's discover, where you freely explore and enjoy the breathtaking landscapes, reach secret places to collect useful items and hidden treasures. There's struggle. Most of the living have perished, but the world isn't quiet. Dark enemies will wake from their slumber to end your journey. You can level up and acquire new abilities which allow you to double jump, slingshot or teleport, transforming the way you see the world. There's meditation which allows you to enter these safe astral planes to practice your parkour and test your skills with numerous challenges and leaderboards. There's a merchant's lair which allows you to study your enemies, prepare for exploration, train and also lay around. They advertise a feature called Shape, where you can command the sky to influence the environment, affecting both visuals and parkour. Distort gravity, control heat, or summon floods. Your surroundings may be your only ally. So far, the game has delivered on all of these features within the first hour or two of the game. It's got a good amount of features that allows the game to feel a bit more diverse. My experience with the game so far has been pretty immersive and addictive. I love just running and parkouring around the environments to see how high I can get. The game does feel easy and rudimentary with the gameplay, although I imagine this is likely to change later in the game. This isn't entirely a bad thing though. For me personally, I find the relaxing side of parkour and platforming a very welcome and refreshing touch. I've been using a controller to play and the controls are great. They're very simple and easy to get used to. They're also very responsive. One thing I liked in particular was the ability to hold jump to auto parkour some platforms and areas. This might sound over the top handholdy, but you still have to be careful not to overshoot your mark. 
In fact, there are times where I have to rely on my own skills instead of the auto jumping because I've missed a platform or I jump unintentionally. I also like that they have a 180 button to allow you to do an instant 180 degree turn. The parkour is fairly basic at its core. You have your normal run, dash, jump, climbing and wall running. When wall running, you can press jump again to get some more height. And if there's two walls side by side, you can wall jump between them continuously. You can dash off a ledge to launch yourself a bit further than a normal jump. But that's about as far as the standard parkour goes. There is the addition of anomalies, and these are basically magical entities you interact with to help you traverse to places that your normal parkour wouldn't allow. The only anomaly I've encountered so far is the one that allows you to jump higher. The game does have some secondary mechanics as well. Saving the game is done by ringing bells scattered throughout the landscapes. They also act as your spawn points if you load the game or die. You have health, stamina, or focus, and marks which can be replenished at fountains that are scattered throughout the environment. It does have RPG mechanics, but they're somewhat basic and done in, in the form of a leveling system. You collect experience in the form of currency known as sky pieces and use them to buy new abilities. To make things more interesting, dying actually costs you sky pieces. There is a skill to reduce this though, and you can upgrade that skill to eventually prevent it. The skill tree is split into four categories and has another six skills within each category. I've only unlocked a few skills, so I've got the one that gives me more stamina or focus so I can dash. I've got the one that gives me extra charges, and then I've got a few others here and there that give me like extra health and that crap. Marks act as temporary checkpoints that you can place down. They come in handy for difficult parkour situations or can aid you in combat. When placed on the ground, it allows you to teleport back to them at the press of a button. Marks have limited charges and can only be refilled at fountains, so this allows it to maintain some level of challenge, because if you run out near a difficult parkour area, your only option is to get it right. Navigating the environments is pretty fun. The zones seem well sized, they're big enough to give you a fair bit to explore. To help with navigation, you have a compass at the top of the screen which displays some useful icons. There's also manholes scattered throughout the levels to allow you to traverse to different areas. Some areas do require a certain amount of artifacts to get through to encourage exploring. On top of this, they have organic markings placed all over the landscapes to give you a sense of direction. There's walls with painted patterns on them that indicate a wall running area. There's wooden planks hanging off some ledges like broken ladders to indicate that you can jump and climb on them. But unlike some games in the past, you're not limited to climbing only marked ledges. The enemies to start off with or at the start of the game aren't very diverse and they're fairly simple to overcome because their tactics remain the same. The Ancient Guardians will try to attack you and at some point will slam the ground with an area of effect attack. Doing this will cause the artifacts on their backs to glow blue, allowing you to remove them and in the process destroying the Guardians. There's no way for you to actually actively attack them. All you can do is dodge their attacks and dash in when the time is right. The fights are very swift as well, although they do take a fair bit of your health if, you're, if you take damage. I should note that the health can be replenished by holding Y, but this does use a charge. The game has other hostiles like drones, turrets, and even the environment. Drones can be destroyed by approaching from behind unseen and removing their power source. Turrets work in a similar way, but basically you just find their power source nearby and destroy it. With the environment, apart from falling to your death, you can actually be injured by things like lava. Even the cacti will hurt your character. What I'm enjoying about the game the most is just how fluid and how open the landscapes are. Before buying the game, I expected it to be a fairly linear experience. It wasn't until after I got the game that I found out it was an open world game. It surprised me at how open it was as well and how I felt naturally compelled to explore. Parkouring and exploring just feels so relaxing and satisfying in this. I, I, what I like even more was that collectibles have value. They're not just there to collect and earn a trophy. You'll find collectibles like bowls, cups, even fruits and more. Each collectible is unique, but they can also be sold at a merchant for sky pieces. The visuals in this game are freaking gorgeous, stunning, and as advertised, they are truly breathtaking. 
The art style comes off as a bit cartoony, but there's a lot of detail while everything is sharp, crisp and clean. They also haven't used any cheap looking textures or left them flat either, bar a few rocks here and there that you can ignore. It's a very bright and vibrant game in general. In the starting area, it emphasizes a beach and coastal area by combining yellow sands with the rock-like ruins and even some lush green to add vibrance to the environment. If you look out towards the ocean, you can see the reflective surface of the water with some lively ripples. The lava area I visited combined dark burnt rocks with hot red lava and again ruined buildings to emphasize an area devastated by a volcanic incident. Despite being an area seemingly ravaged by a volcanic eruption, it still maintained a level of vibrance. The animations are pretty good too, there are some times where climbing a ledge can look a bit odd but it happens infrequently so you barely notice. Something that amused me was that when you looked down at your character's feet and stomach and then crouched, you could see his stomach roll a bit like it would in real life. Or at least, that's how mine works in real life and I imagine that everyone else's does. Each anomaly has their own animation and they're designed to look significantly different from each other to help distinguish them easily, but their design also helps to emphasize the magical and mystical nature of these anomalies and the game world. The physics in the game looks fairly good as well, especially when you knock over objects and you watch them fall to the ground in different ways. What I liked the most about the visuals was the level of quality and detail. In fact, this has to be by far one of the best looking indie games I've seen. They were able to deliver a level of quality that could even compete with some AAA titles. The heads up display is really nice and clean and simple. In fact, it doesn't always appear until required. You have your compass at the top of the screen, which blends into the HUD really well. To the right you have your collectibles. At the bottom, from left to right, you have your health, charges and stamina or the focus. Now in regards to performance, to note off first I am running a GTX 980 Ti graphics card or GPU with driver version 378.49 and an FX 8350 processor or CPU. You'll be able to see the hardware statistics on the screen to the left right about now in yellow. Video memory usage doesn't seem to go above 40% while CPU usage averages around 50%. However, a single core may spike to 95% at times, which is a bit odd, as it should be relying on the GPU the most. The performance of the game is okay. It's able to hold itself above 60 frames per second and fluctuates between 60 to 90, but I'd say based on my limited observation, it has an average of about 70. Performance does seem to be heavily affected by whether it's daytime or nighttime in the game. During daytime, the game doesn't drop below 60 frames. However, during nighttime, it can struggle to hold 60 frames, often fluctuating between 47 to 55 with dips as low as 42. All of this is made even more odd to me by the fact that the system requirements actually recommends a GPU that's a GTX 960. Given that the game has generally held above 40 frames, it hasn't limited my experience with the game a great deal. However, it's safe to say it does need a fair bit of improvement to the optimization, especially now that it's out of early access. Audio is probably where the game suffers the most. It does well in the music area but does poorly with sound effects. While it utilizes surround sound, which is a definite plus, it unfortunately does it poorly. When your character talks, most times the audio comes out of the rear speakers and on occasion it comes from the front. A character's voice should always come from the front and center speakers because they can only ever talk in the direction you're facing. However, when talking to NPCs, their voices come through the correct speakers and will be based on where you're facing. Sound effects, when present, generally sound pretty good, but too often are they missing. Much like the voices, some sound effects are continually output through the rear speakers. Other sound effects like anomalies, enemies, and ambience are present and fairly convincing. You can hear some ambient sounds from the environments, which adds some life to the levels. But when it comes to the characters' movements, there's quite a lot of sound effects missing or they're often hard to hear. The ambient music is super chill and tranquil, which helps to feel you relaxed in out of combat situations. It's done well enough that it doesn't overpower other sounds, but can still be heard quite well. The combat music also transitions in and out seamlessly. While it maintains some level of tranquility, it does well to balance intensity with relaxation. Now we're going on to some of the boring stuff as usual. The menu and user interface is actually really nice. It's neat, tidy and easy to read. While it doesn't match the game's theme, it still looks good and classy. The menu starts off fairly standard. You have your new game, challenges, options and quit. The options menu is very nice and diverse. In game settings, you have a decent range of settings to play with, including the ability to turn off and on tutorials, the crosshair and wall jump camera retargeting. 
Sound settings have a very good amount of options. You have effects, music, master volume, ambient volume, and voice volume as well. You can also find the option to turn subtitles on and off here too. Graphics is where it gets even more diverse. I like that they had a frame limiter as well as the option for VSync, and display mode included all three of the expected options, which are full screen, window, and windowed full screen. You have a lot of your other expected options like textures, shadows, post-processing, and anti-aliasing, ranging from low, medium, high, to ultra. Then the advanced settings allowed you to tweak filter-based options like field of view, which ranges up to 110, brightness, motion blur, and more. Controls let you remap all the keyboard bindings, while controller mapping also lets you rebind all the controller buttons, which is a very big plus here, because a lot of games that support X input tend to lock the control scheme, and even they don't even provide set preset schemes for you to choose from. All of these options can also be accessed in the pause menu. It also conveniently has a tutorials option which you can access in game at any time. In addition to that, the loading screen has a few hints and some of them provide a little bit of amusement in the way they're written. I did have three issues with the menu though. One was when you had games selected with a controller, you had to move down one option to be able to move across to the right. And two, when remapping bindings, there didn't seem to be a way to properly exit once you initiated it. You have to be careful here because if you try pressing escape while binding something, it will actually bind escape to that action. And three, you can't have multiple saves as far as I can tell. You can only continue your game or start a new game, which overwrites your current save. Not a big issue, but it would have been nice if we could start a new game while keeping the old save as well. Otherwise, it's a really well done menu and should satisfy people's tweaking needs. Now, before I conclude this video, I, I want to note that the game is currently 13 Aussie dollars on Steam, give or take a, a few dollars or so and $10 in the other currency of that other country no one cares about. If you're interested in the game but on the fence about it, there is a demo available. It is a fairly decent demo too, should give you enough of an idea of whether you want to buy it or not. Even if you can't afford the game, it might be worth trying the demo just to get a feel and taste of it. I can easily recommend this game, and e even if you're going to buy it, just try out the demo. Just try it out, because it it's, it's a decent demo and it might change your mind whether you're for or against the game. Like I said, I can easily recommend this game. It's done fairly well. Links will be in the description for the for more information on the game, the link to the demo as well, which is the Steam page anyways, and obviously, yeah, the Steam page, I'll be linking all that stuff. I'd like to thank Caracal Games in advance for allowing me to showcase this game. Thank you to each and every one of you who have watched this video so far, I really appreciate it. If you have any thoughts about the video or if you have any thoughts about the game, please leave them in the comments down below. I'd like to hear them because it gives me an idea of whether I'm showcasing the right type of game or not. And like I said, just try out the demo. Let me know what you thought. I'm curious because I don't really want to be showcasing games that people aren't that interested in. You should be interested in it even if you don't really want to play it. It's just a really well done game. It has a lot going for it. Downward isn't perfect, it has its flaws, some of which are ignorable and others have you asking how these flaws made it past early access. If the developers can manage to fix these flaws, Downward could easily rise above other first-person parkour games out there. In fact, I couldn't stand a game like Mirror's Edge. I quit after playing a few hours, and I've actually clocked 3.7 hours on Downward. Downward does have this odd charm about it, one that allows it to overcome some of its flaws. It's magical, mysterious, vibrant, story-rich, and absolutely stunning world helps to entrance and immerse you making it a worthwhile experience. Fortunately, Downward is already a fairly well done game, and with improvements, it can only go upward. 